uh, heavy object. Um, Kim says, yeah, the, the, the neural event was also a mental event. It did cause uh, the blink, and so a mental event caused uh, the blink, but not quite a mental event. That is, one of the properties of the event, being that experience, was not actually causally relevant. It wasn't a causal power of that event. The, only the, power, only the um, features of the event contained in the neuro, purely neural description of the event are causal uh, powers of the event. So here's an analogy. Imagine a billiard ball strikes another billiard ball. If you buy the, the standard picture of the causal relation of the event, uh, A is causing, uh, A is striking B, that event causes this other event, B is beginning to move. Well, let's take that event, A, call, A is striking B. Call A the subject of the event and B its object. The, that is, one, a billiard, one billiard ball is the subject of the event, is, the other is the object. Let's say one property of this event, A striking B, is um, having a red subject. That's a property of the event, all right, but it isn't one of its causal powers. It doesn't actually, uh, and that's not like having a subject with a mass, which is one of the causal powers uh, of the event. Uh, so Kim's point is that the, uh, these mental properties of events, assuming neuro, some neural events have mental properties, are never actually part of the causal uh, influence that they exert uh, on other events. They're just, uh, they're just along for the ride, as it were. So that's what he means um, by, uh, that's his general uh, point. And of course, he, and he explicitly rejects the nomological subsumption account of um, causation for the usual reasons. You know, maybe, maybe it's a law that, uh, um, say that uh, a beating heart makes a thump, thump, thump sound. Maybe it's a law that uh, if a beating heart stops making a thump, thump, thump uh, sound permanently, then the organism whose heart it is dies. Uh, still, Socrates' heart ceasing to go thump, thump, thump was not a cause of Socrates' death, uh, but would be under the, no, under the nomological subsumption account if, that, if those two statements were indeed um, laws. All I want to say, you know, my point about Kim uh, and those th theses that I mentioned was this. Yeah, take, say, this book, which has an art, a new article by, re relatively new article by Kim in it, and also uh, a, a reply by, I think, uh, Brian McLaughlin, somebody, or I don't know, uh, 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 now I've forgotten who, but somebody replied. Go through both those articles that discuss this argument. Try to formulate the arguments, either advanced or criticized, therein on the basis of these assumptions. I say you won't be able to do it. You will have at some point to suppose that there are events, that events uh, stand in the relation causation. Or maybe you'll have to suppose that there are states uh, and physical states, at least, have causal powers to produce other physical states. You just will not be able uh, to state the argument without making uh, these uh, assumptions. Um, okay, finally, on the business of uh, supermenience and uh, so on. Okay, first of all, uh, what I did mean, what I meant by saying that mental states uh, uh, supervene on the distribution of matter and radiation was actually the first suggestion as to how it might improve it. That is, any mental state supervenes on the whole thing. I wasn't thinking about quantum entanglement. I was uh, thinking of um, Kripke Putnam uh, considerations about the content of mental states, but uh, uh, at any rate, that was the uh, assumption. The general problems that Robin uh, raises uh, are, of course, real problems that physics presents to someone, to some philosophers, but those are actually the philosophers who think that the idea of supervenience makes any sense at all. That is the idea of a physical supervenience state that other things can supervene on, whether they're its colors or metal states or something like that. Um, yeah, it is, if you look at it from the most austere uh, points of quantum field theories, it is extremely hard uh, to formulate a precise notion of the supervenience. Base. Still, one thinks there must be something to the idea. There must be something to the idea that the software supervenes on the hardware. That you can have two physically, if you have two physically identical computers in every respect, they will be running the same software. So at least there's a, a research project there. Uh, so treat everything I said about uh, supervenience there as concessive 
you know, insofar as I understand the notion and I'm willing to admit that it makes sense, you know, then I tend to think of everything as supervening on the distribution of matter and radiation in space time. Uh, okay. I think we have uh, just about 10 minutes for questions, and so we'll and so we'll start with you. Okay, so your target is Kim-style arguments for epiphenomenalism. Uh, I want to try to reconstruct a Kim-style argument from ex explanatory exclusion that works only within your framework. Mm -hmm. um, you may not think it sufficiently Kimish, or I may say lots of things that you don't understand, but here goes. Um, it seems to me that it's not wholly implausible that one of the things that can be explained uh, is the correctness of an explanation. Um, and that the correctness of the explanation of the unlocking of a door in the language of everyday life is explained by the correctness of the explanation in the language of uh, fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental science. And well, that, that is, that's the answer to why is that explanation written on the blackboard there a correct explanation of the unlocking of the Yeah, theory? something like yeah, that. Ahead. Yeah. And that, um, that there's an asymmetry here. Uh, it's not the case that the correctness of the explanation in terms of fundamental physics mm -hmm. is explained by the correctness of the explanation in the language of everyday life. And, and I mean here just mm -hmm. uh, turn, push, um, and, and so forth. And, and likewise with the, with the uh, mental vocabulary of the language of everyday life. And that this would render uh, explanations in terms of mental language somewhat uh, explanatorily inert and uh, leave, leave them explanatory residue, which would be a form of uh, uh, Epiphenomenalism. So, I'm, I'm at, why, why are the mental explanations of mental language in a different boat from the explanations uh, that contain just push and pull? No, and, no I, I was saying they're in precisely the same situation. Well, does, do you, are the are the ordinary explanations in terms of pushing and pulling and uh, are are they ever right? Yeah. So why couldn't the mental explanations be? I'm not. I'm not. Questioning their rightness. Okay. I'm questioning their where they really contribute to uh, the understanding. There's an asymmetry, it seems, that there's there's um, something deeper about the explanation of the turning of a lock in terms of fundamental physics than in terms of pushing, pulling, and and uh, so forth, and that the same thing applies to uh, the mental vocabulary. And so that there's a f sort of fundamentality to the physical explanation of decisions. Well, yeah, but let's suppose there are. Remember, Kim's conclusion was not just that one thing is deeper than so something else. It's that the mental actually doesn't contribute causally uh, to what we do. Now, so he talks causally, but he also talks explanatorily. And the idea here is that, is that the, the correctness of the explanations in ordinary life are really... Well, that, that is correct. Suppose this event causes that, this event has some mental properties, the explanation of why this event causes that uh, won't appeal to the mental properties of uh, that event because they're causally uh, irrelevant. But I don't know how you would translate that conclusion into a term where there are no events and no states, just causal explanations. Probably the closest I could come was the mental language in this uh, explanation um, is adventitious or superfluous. Right. But I, I will take the explanation of Tom's black eye. Let's see you subtract the, I can't, I don't know how to subtract the metal, expo, uh, the metal language from that and get anything left over at all. You certainly won't get the God's ex, eye explanation in terms of particles. And if the explanation is true, well, that's all I said. That metal language is essential to it and it's right. That, that's all my point. And we'll go to alternate microphones. I'd like to remind uh, questioners so we don't have a lot of time. You offer a problem for property dualism on the basis of an intuition pump, whereby if God fixes all the physical facts, doesn't he thereby automatically fix these other facts in a world where everything created is physical? And I want to offer a different analogy and see what you think about it. So suppose God distributes a bunch of massive bodies 
Um, do we then, does he then by, thereby fix all of their powers? And it seems to me no, because he might do 